Hey, how's it going? It's so good. How are you? Just uh, super fantastic. This is a nice part of the day, being crazy busy like I am, to just like sit and chill and talk. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, totally. I feel the opposite. My life is so there's so much space right now. I'm like preparing for a really busy time, but I'm just like laxing and slow motion. It's great. Cool. Um, it's a good time to be able to go within and get in touch with like how you actually feel about things. Whenever you're crazy busy, you can be so in the, in the thick of that, that you don't necessarily take time to contemplate. Although I do make sure and give myself that time. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot harder when you're crammed for time for sure. Oh yeah. So what's uh, the big change on the horizon that's going to make um, you really busy? Kind of, kind of just the season. I've got um, a bunch of like weddings and bachelorette parties and like that kind of stuff is happening. But um, I'm also signing up for the like 200 hour first like part of the yoga certification. Oh, um, very good. Yeah. So I'm really excited about that. I've been um, digging into my like textbooks and but, well, they're not really textbooks as a thing, but like the yoga sutras um, and some of these like anatomy books about the muscle groups. And um, yeah, I'm so excited. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot to learn. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that's yeah, a And like there's a Sanskrit book too that comes with it. Cause I guess for the names of the poses, like the Sanskrit translations are really give you a lot of insight into what the poses are supposed to really um, like evoke. and so it's like language, biology, and religion, like stuffed into this eight-week class. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it's a lot more than eight weeks can really contain. It's like here are the directions that you need to go in on your own, basically, and learn about all these connections and correspondences that are there. Oh, no, internet yeah. connection unstable. Okay, I think it's clearing up. It sounds better now, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, um, I need to learn more yoga personally. I have an energy and physical like stretching and movement practice through qigong but mm. i really don't know much yoga and i think it would be a good thing to complement one another yeah i think as i'm learning more i feel weird like I, I think it's a good thing that i'm weird but like i feel weird that i'm so much more interested in sort of like the foundation and the history and the 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 more the mental aspect of yoga or like the removing of the mental aspect, which is like kind of what yoga is all about. <laughs> the asanas, the postures are kind of like just maybe one eighth of the whole like thing that is yoga. Right. And I, I mean, I don't, I practice like, a, like, I don't know. I mean, I practice like once a week right now. I'm going to confess, like I'm not like a daily yogi, but I do like read about it all the time. And I'm watching these like documentaries about it all the time. I'm so fascinated with like the, philosophy behind it and the physical stuff I'm sure will come with habit but yeah I'm stoked to just dive in and find out more about what it's all about yeah the left right brain balance with the practice like that is where it becomes really useful it's like you want to be able to study the all the correspondences and meanings of each pose and how it affects different parts of the body and how there's also like um, aromatherapy or uh, mm -hmm. Ayurveda is that how you say that <laughs> There's all, all kinds of different ways that you can approach the same. Yeah, what is really cool is the chakras are like a, a guide where by knowing what it is that is needed, by knowing what's going wrong with the person, you can correspond it to a chakra and then go, okay, there's a movement for that. There's a hand mudra for that. There's a yeah. pose for that. There's a scent for that. There's a color <laughs> for that. It's crazy. And we, it's like, um, this ancient wisdom that has come across in more than one culture, the same exact type of ideas, uh, especially related to some of the archetypical things like color and like where different energetic parts of your body, um, co how those correspond to different parts of, of the human experience. Like, you know, everyone has always known the heart is the balance center point, the, of the feeling area. And like, it's not just the yogic tradition that says the heart chakra is what it is, you know? Mm hmm. Yeah, that's so funny you say that because I was um, just watching this video about the evolution of colors and how, like, depending on how advanced or how much language has evolved, like within a certain society, they have like specific names for specific colors. And like they increase in variety, like as the society gets more complex. Um, so like all civilizations have like a color for a name for black and white, but then it evolves to like where they get red. And then usually 
yellow or green and then like green and blue and blue and purple like it's crazy how it just like totally matches that hierarchy i've heard of uh cultures that skip different colors accidentally <laughs> like <laughs> there have been uncontacted people in the jungle and this is like podcast bro science i heard this somewhere i think probably mysterious <laughs> universe uh, mysterious universe podcast you can trust them though um <laughs> Anyway, someone contacted tribe that had uh, no col no color for blue, no name for the color blue, no word for it. So whenever they looked in the sky, they would describe it as green or purple. They would use those <laughs> words for it. Even and I don't know if they were actually like I think they're actually seeing it that way too. Is what's crazy, and that would make sense because our you know there's this weird set of filters between the direct experience of the present moment of reality and uh, what we actually see in our mind's eye. It's very mm -hmm. strange. Like all of this external world that we're so focused on actually only exists within your mind. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And even just in the first couple, the first four yoga sutras, they talk about that. And I'm reading this translation from um, this amazing master that I can't remember his name or even pronounce it right now. But um, he talks about how like, Oh, it's this amazing metaphor to describe that exact point. He says, like, when you're a little kid, imagine um, a stranger knocking on your door and you open it and it's this man. And he's like, you don't recognize him and you kind of frown and say, like, Ma, who's this guy? And she comes into the room and just like screams with joy. She's so excited. And she's like, this is your father. And just like welcomes him and loves him. And so in an instant, he goes from being a stranger to you to being like your father and you like embrace him too, but how all of reality is like that. And <laughs> it switch like a light switch on how you feel about an object because it's all just up here. Wow. And or a situation too, or a person that might be seeming to be, um, you know, an opposition to you, but in, and even if they are behaving in an oppositional way, you can still go, okay, this is actually <clears throat> not just me, but it's a part of me that's trying to get me past something that I've been stuck on, especially if it's a t like, I, you'll always notice with people, uh, they'll complain about the same types of people in the same types of situations all the time over and over again. And I'm no different than that. Uh, in that way. It's nice though. Once you realize that there's a pattern starting to emerge in this sort of, um, seemingly maybe negative interactions or situations how you can then uh you know like we said before address it in a m multitude of ways depending on how much uh, knowledge of correspondence uses you've actually advanced through mm -hmm. yeah i'm i think i it's kind of a recent that i feel like i'm, I'm in my mid-20s right now and so many of the life steps that I've come up to up to, you know, a few years ago were really plotted out from like a long time ago. Um, and it's so liberating being in this period of my life because I get to recraft the whole story going forward. And it's not like dependent on this idea I've had since I was a kid. And part of the beauty of that is like, you get to choose like what parts you want to keep and what parts you don't. And sometimes those are people and sometimes um, I don't know. I'm, I feel like I've launched into it and going to envision was almost this like pinnacle of, um, that like recognizing that this journey that I'm on is being shared by so many other people and not just from like a coming of age, you know, like getting into your twenties kind of journey, like really evolving into your higher chakras and like awakening to the higher reality that we're living in. And I think some parts of that are so exciting and liberating and you're like, wow, I have this whole new capacity to like interact with people on its different level but then you kind of like look back at like all these relationships that you've made and I don't know if this is like a this is something that I'm working past right now but it's so much easier to recognize like the earlier stages and get frustrated almost with how like simplistically and like hard-headedly people can look at their problems and not see them as opportunities to grow like that. Oh, yeah. Um, especially in a familial sense, a lot of times. And this isn't anything against my own family, if they're listening. It's just like a, a thing about <laughs> families. Families in general, they tend to like, and friend groups can be this way too, I, I know. Uh, people will tend to take turns being the one that like acts out different dramas. And everyone will pay a lot of attention to that drama and be so caught up in it that there's definitely no time to contemplate like, Hey, we are talking monkeys flying on a space rock. Um, 
going around a giant fireball that's going around a giant black hole that's going around we don't know what because it's infinitely big hey let's think about it <laughs> you know like <laughs> that never comes up with your family like hey what's the nature of consciousness do you think that the material universe generates consciousness or do you think consciousness generates the material world they're just like <laughs> what donald trump fired this guy in his cabinet today and i'm just like cool <laughs> what about <laughs> this <laughs> yeah but yeah and that's not uh you know that's the other thing if they're not caught up in each other's little stories and dramas then they've got something else to fill that role just fine whether it's like uh like for me i used to do it with comic books really hardcore and to an extent there's still like growth and good things to be mined from any work of art so it's not like i say never do that or like with movies or video games or with celebrity following or reality tv all these things are just these weird distraction bubbles we've uh given ourselves so that we can just stay at a plateau and be entertained there instead of having to feel the the actual anguish of the feeling of of not moving forward because <laughs> that's a terrible feeling yeah but in, it's easier to notice in other people of course and i guess i'm constantly going back and forth now because this is like a big this is like a either a chakra that i'm clearing right now or just a mental barrier that i need to like push through but um rec when you can recognize like almost that flaw in another person more easily than you can recognize it in yourself and then you realize like oh shit i've been really judging that person but really it's like i'm judging that part of myself too and i've been like working on catching myself more when i get that judgy feeling to be like no no I'm dealing with this too. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, until you attain the perfected state, which is most likely not attainable, <laughs> there will be <laughs> no real room to cast actual judgments, but there is, there is um, a level of discernment that comes with a higher level of, I guess, like chakra opening, you know, especially when you reach the crown chakra, third eye chakra region, you're able to, see the symbolic meaning behind the things that are happening a little more clearly and the the trap that you want to avoid at that point i guess is um not to start feeling like you're controlling everything because mm -hmm. in the third eye with the the symbolic um heart-centered vision turned on and you're like okay this corresponds to this and this person in my life symbolizes that really easy to get into the idea that everything is your fault or everything is up to you or you know, all kinds of different ways of um, externalizing your reality too much, I guess. And uh, you're almost like becoming so egocentric that you think it's because of you rather than like you're a moving part within the whole system. That's exactly what I was trying to get to and not getting to. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I read you. Yeah, it's a, you, you have a great ripple effect and influence on your environment, no doubt. But um, yeah, it is a very... It's a dangerous egocentric uh, thing to think that you're in control of every everybody else um, that takes away their consciousness and their, you know, their right to choose. And they everybody else's is equal to you in this in terms of being able to choose their way forward. That That's why you can't tell anybody what to do. But if you live by your own highest potential example, then um, it gives a lot of people more courage to do the same thing, I would think. Yeah, for sure. That's a, one of the, like I was saying before, one of the very first yoga sutras is like you can't, um, yoga doesn't really focus at all on changing the outer world. It's all about changing your inner world because you can only really lead by example. You can't change other people or other things at all. You can just change yourself. That's what the crown chakra is really about is the full ability to be in sovereign um, Com control is the only place where you have control is that inner world or you your connection to the outer world is just the it's through your speech and actions sure um but any actions that do try to control things outside of what is what you know what you could call natural law or just basic right and wrong <laughs> anything that you try to control that's wrong for you to control that's just going to send you spiraling down into fear consciousness because the universe is slippery and it's, it's going to resist that <laughs> attempt to control things. Yeah, that's an interesting insight. I think um, it's kind of weird thinking that you're like all alone in your own head and that you have no control over reality. But there's also like, I don't know, I just get tripped out sometimes thinking about the infinity of like possibilities. Um, 
I just watched this crazy movie about like basically how no no choice is the wrong choice and all of those infinite possibilities kind of end up playing out on their own anyway and maybe alternate dimensions or even in your mind um i don't know if you've seen mr nobody but i would highly recommend it have not oh yeah it was a trip but yeah i guess sometimes and maybe this is kind of a symptom of like living in the age of stuffing way too much information into my brain instead of just like chilling out and letting me like pick what I want to believe or think. Um, that's kind of how I feel like I'm in this part of my life right now. I'm kind of washing out all of the old like stimuli and content and just like keeping a really flat, fresh palette so that when I find what I'm like kind of ultimately destined to do that it's like I'm ready for it. I have space for it and I will recognize it. Um, but sometimes it can be really paralyzing to think like what if I make the wrong choice and what if this isn't you know, part of my path or, you know, I actually recommend in the time that you're in right now, uh, as far as an activity goes, actually do some research, do some reading, do some personal study. Cause when you get into a heavy flow of being just in whatever your creative passion is or whatever your life path is, and that's taking up all your time, but that you're finding yourself needing more information to about the situations you're in, you're going to wish you had more time to read. That's coming from me right now that just like it barely can fit in, uh, you know, a mere paltry few pages a day at cracking away at books. And um, it, I feel like I would gain a lot of benefit from it because it reading is a way of, both taking in information and reflecting internally because all of it is going like just directly into your contemplation machine <laughs> when you're reading it. It's not, <laughs> you can't like, you can, I guess, passively just look over the words and half read them and not pay attention to what you're doing. But most of the time when you're reading, you're actually taking that information in as opposed to like, I do a lot of listening information podcast, obviously. And sometimes I can just tune it out and go, Oh damn, I got to rewind five minutes. Um, <laughs> totally. But, you're also easy, easily led into sort of just going with what someone's saying whenever you're uh, listening to them. And with reading, I don't know, I feel like I'm more able to critically think about what I'm going over and even remember it better. And anyway, reading, man, it's a lost art. <laughs> it's really helpful. <laughs> it's also really weird because we've only been doing it as a people in mass for a few hundred years. Yeah, isn't that nuts? When before that, the ruling classes were the only ones who could read, and they used that against us. So that tells you the importance of learning to read for gaining freedom. Um, another reason to do it on this, for the same metaphor, the word in Latin for freedom is liber, and the word for book is liber. It's the same word, <laughs> freedom <laughs> and book in Latin. Oh, and, I love that. And Latin is the language of the Vatican, which is – at least one of the central locations of evil power in the world right now. So, so yeah, they, they know that reading is freedom. I think more people should wake up to that. Uh, we're, we're in the age of information. There's, you're never going to even come close to scratching the surface of everything you're interested in. So, but then, you know, there's balance to be had as well. For sure. Yeah. Right. Chilling is good. <laughs> Chilling or even like, like I was saying earlier, getting back into or more into the physical practice. Cause, um, I think there is for sure, like for me, especially my comfort zone is sort of up here in the mental realm. And, um, I can just go straight home after work and go crash on the couch and just read a book like the rest of the night or watch TV or something. Um, because I just love taking in more and more information, but it got to a point like this spring where my mind was just like, shredding and I just didn't know what to do with all the information. So I was like meditating a lot and I love to use like tarot cards and like Oracle cards and, um, that setting for me, like I have a roomy deck and the poetry in it is just like amazing. But the idea that you can like kind of shuffle all that information and then like extract really the insight that you need most precisely at that moment. Um, but anyway, I was getting, uh, all these messages that, I need to go like running and like do leg workouts or like <laughs> take the stairs instead of taking the elevator, like all these little messages, like get into your lower body, Beth. <laughs> you can have like too much, 
you know, too much going on in your upper chakras. And if that energy doesn't distribute through the rest of your body, then, um, it can just kind of become concentrated and cause its own problems too. Oh yeah. I run into that one a lot and I don't think I articulate it in my own mental landscape the way that you are here. And, uh, actually just today I finally made a pretty good effort towards that type of balance. Like I had a solid leg workout and core workout today and I felt just dramatically less crazy <laughs> afterwards. I was like, okay. I also felt a little sick. So that's another indication that I needed to, uh, really needed to have a workout like that. If I, it wasn't that intensive and I was not feeling that good afterwards. So, um, you know, I, as many positive changes as I've made in my life over the last year, year and a half, especially relating to diet, there's still such a humongous mountain to climb as far as optimizing my mind body connection and, mm -hmm uh really being in a balanced point between those lower chakras and higher chakras because like you said I can hang out in the higher chakras all day my <laughs> my day job I'm sitting on a computer uh like building websites and stuff like that so that's you know that's completely up in the air mental realm and then you know coming home I come work on something like this most of my time whenever I'm yeah I've been into rock climbing I've I've mentioned that on the show and that's been the real helpful balancer, but without that's very upper body still and very mental even, and without yeah. having some other types of exercise and uh, Qigong gets me into my legs really well as well because of some of the like horse stance and, and all that. But yeah, without that, it makes it harder to do the, uh, the other stuff, actually the, the completely left brain activities I get, or right brain activities, I guess they are. I don't know. <laughs> I know. I always get that wrong too. I'm not a black or white kind of person. Like colors make more sense to me than I'll always forget your name, but I'll never forget your face. I'm the same. <laughs> but I think you're right. That mind body connection um, for me, like the gateway has never, ever been exercise. Like, I don't know why, I guess like maybe it's like a confidence thing or a, like a like, uh, I don't know, a childhood, like, no, nah, I'm, I'm not as good as the other kids. So I'm not going to do that. Like there's some other block that I, you know, I'll work up to that. Um, but for me getting back into my body after like this, you know, after going to school and university and like trying, like I went through two different really like in intense, like jobs where I was learning a ton right away. Um, from that period of my life, like it's kind of transitioned into this, you know, kind of slow descent down into the lower body. And, diet has been a big, that's been like my gateway, I guess. Um, but you're so right when you're connected to like what you're putting into your body every day and you're making those decisions, like, especially if you're cooking or going, actually doing the food shopping yourself and, um, or growing food. Yeah. Goals, dude. Yeah. <laughs> it's like intent. You think about like, what am I putting in my body? Where did I get it? And how does it feel as it goes through my body? Like, I just did an elimination cleanse for like a whole month in April and it was so cool just to have that, like not the physical experience of it. Cause that was obviously part of it, but just having that record every day of like, okay, this is what I ate. And it like when you're on a cleanse, it kind of just, everything speeds up. So something that might have taken a day for you to digest would take maybe just like half a day. Um, so you get like a lot of feedback from your body. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a really cool concept to, to ponder for so a it was uh, like a was it like a toxin cleanse for multiple organs did it have sort of like a, a methodology going on so I started out with a parasite cleanse for just all of the parasites in my digestive system I and need that yeah it was so cool I did it after um, I was gonna do it right before Envision before I went to Costa Rica but um, decided it'd probably be best to do it after and yeah it rocked it was like cleaned all the gut out completely and then you lose a lot of like probiotics. So you have to be like drinking a lot of kombucha and raw food to replenish those. Um, but then after that, I followed it with a colon cleanse, which kind of like, it's almost like it kind of scrubs your digestive system. So anything that's like hanging out that needs to go, that's been there for a while, it helps flush that out. I too. did one of those actually and made a, a before and after podcast with my friend, Chris, who <laughs> did, uh, did it as well at the same time. So I'm familiar with that one. Nice. It's a very intensive process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then and there I was mean, an organ cleanse after that? Nope. I just did those two. So they were both like 14-day deals and um, five followed them one right after the other. And so the whole month I just focused really hard on like eating totally vegan, 
Um, cause before I've been like a fair weather, you know, a vegetarian for the most part, but like this was, April was a pretty hardcore month and it was really fun. <laughs> was there any, was there like some, uh, no food liquid only parts of that, um, colon cleanse? No, not on this one, I guess. Um, so I took the cleanse part of it was this, uh, like this supplement package. So it included herbs, um, totally natural, like herbs, like wormwood and, um, I forget what else is in there. It sounds like a witch brews it and puts it in a pill for you. <laughs> um, and it perhaps kind of go along with uh, just eating like a raw food diet for an, and vegan and no meat helps a ton. So just. Well, so um, being able to even back to what you're talking about with exercise and correlation with this, being able to have the mental ability to choose and follow through on something like, a cleanse where there's a dietary aspect and it might not be the most comfortable thing that you're going through physically and combine, um, compare that to working out and doing more than just going through the motions and actually setting up challenges and goals and disciplining yourself and then following through on that even when it's really hard and makes you want to puke. Those, <laughs> those two aspects are uh, in the Kabbalistic tradition, you have the left and right pillars that um if you balance that's what allows your soul to ascend the miller middle pillar and rise to like the position of in the tarot it would be the magician which is you know that's where you want to be the yeah. left hand pillar is known as splendor or glory and that's the internal aspect of being able to uh mentally be brave enough to decide that you're going to do these things and then the right hand pillar is the victory and that's uh that pillar is about actually taking the action in the world that is maybe difficult and, and it's a physical thing. So, but like to even move up to the next levels, love, um, wisdom, understanding, and then all the way up to the crown, those, those, those two that I just mentioned have to be there. And what better way to be able to strengthen <clears throat> those spheres or centers within your being than with just, um, formulating a plan of, of exercise that's going to be difficult and following through with it. I mean, that's what people are not necessarily realizing when they give up physical exercise out of their life or are not considering um, their diet in a way that is disciplined or caring about what they're doing. And you're, you're cutting down your foundations <laughs> of your pillars of your being by mm. not incorporating that. And, you know, our, our ancestors would have no need to even choose whether or not that was going to be the case. They're, you know, they're out there taking care of shit and the, there's no out, there's no inside or outside for them. They're always outside. I mean, <laughs> it's hardcore. <laughs> they're of course, they of course have those pillar bases there and in place. And our, our society is completely designed to just chop us down right at the root there and keep us in um, essentially weakness and lost, you know, lost in the negative manifestations of those fears. So, um, yeah, it's really, sad, really. And then it's, you know, that is what brings consciousness. Those are the pillars of consciousness. So without foundations like that, life feels like you're just sleepwalking. Or at the very, or at the other end of the spectrum, it's just miserably sad. It, I would rather be miserably sad than just be completely shut off and sleepwalking, though. <laughs> <laughs> How do we reach those people? That's what yeah. I wonder. <laughs> that's a, and I'm sure that's a very much smaller subset of people. So it's, a, I've, I heard this, um, this argument very recently about like using the term indigo children. I don't, you probably heard it, but like, um, and this is like not what do you call it? Podcast bro bro podcast info yeah. bro science yeah bro science. there you go bro, bro i heard this i heard this on joe rogan bro <laughs> i love that bro science so, totally bro science from uh like this this youtuber that i follow but um how you can kind of like make yourself feel like special with terms like that um and that kind of just his point was that you really like fall out of unity with um with the rest of the world when you kind of elevate yourself to feel special. Yeah. But there is a distinction between like those who would rather be sad and awake versus those who would rather be like oblivious and asleep. So that's completely true. But what the point you just made that he is making is very important. There's so many traps laid in the new age deluge of information that's been poured out on us. And it's on purpose because 
the <laughs> and the they I'm talking about is also us. This is our own sneaky way of keeping ourselves asleep. We do this to ourselves. Mm-hmm. We these they's are set up putting these systems into place that trip us up because internally there's a part of us that's opposed to our growth and that's just how it is <laughs> and you know we I'm intrigued by that thought so we'll come back to that yeah the opposer fun. yeah the opposer is a very interesting concept uh but you know what what ends up happening with this new age information is they will put out good they'll they'll have people that are putting out really good stuff but then sprinkled in there is just a few concepts that if you really go with that concept you're going to be lost in ego and, you know, the indigo children concept is a great example because there you have the idea that you are capable of healing the world. You're capable of healing yourself and others. You are capable of higher psychic abilities and you are of uh, some sort of special um, extra human lineage. And that's, there's, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff in there. But like you said, when, as soon as you start identifying yourself as separate from other people, it's the same reason why democracy doesn't work. You are saying I'm this and you're all that and therefore for whatever reason we have to have a differential in um, between you know how I see myself and how I see you and that inevitably leads to political maneuvering and power games and really what needs to be uh, we need to be aware of is that we all have the same seed of divine potential within us that the spark can be flamed by any source of energy or heat And the brighter that you personally burn in the name of truth, the more you will fan the flames of others around you, but not if you are in untruth, which is the idea that you're above them. Mm -hmm. Totally. That was really beautifully said, Chance. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Totally. I feel like I'm in tune. Like it's cool talk, you know, breaking from normal life to have a conversation like this because like... I don't know. I feel like when I met you, it was this like instant connection. We immediately connected on like multiple wavelengths and it was like insane, but I believe in soul family. And like, I kind of have this hunch that we've maybe known each other in the past and just don't remember it from this lifetime. But, um, soul family is kind of a like newer, newer concept to me. I don't, I don't know if like, sometimes I, I kind of ponder like ultimate reality versus just what's helpful for my growth and my mindset. And if reincarnation of the soul and like living throughout the species of the human body versus like our actual like soul existence, you know, I, I guess I'm figuring out where I stand on that still. <laughs> yeah. I'm interested in that to a great degree. The issue is that it's not here and now on earth. And so The most you can't get so caught up in that stuff that you're now no longer taking right action in the world. Um, It's kind of like that thing I saw on your uh, Facebook, um, the top of your Facebook, something you had shared. It was just like this diagram of uh, fears, and it's like what I'm best at, what the world needs, what I love, and what I can get paid for. And then, like, where those things converge in the middle, that's where you want to be. That's like your purpose for being or whatever. Um, Right. Although, what I can get paid for is not necessarily the way I would put it, I would put it like what I can exchange for to others for mutual benefit. (laughs) You know, it doesn't have to be like the, unfortunately what I can get paid for makes it sound just a little too connected to money, which has too much other symbolic issue going right now. But, um, I don't even know where I was going with that. I lost my train of thought. Oh no, soul family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. yeah. Yeah. So back to the idea of soul family, uh, I've been doing this research on it where I can reading books by uh, and and stuff by psychologists that do hypnotherapy and take people into um, both past lives. And then they try to take them into a super conscious state that they can remember between lives. And there is a lot of consistency that comes from these people uh, where there's a type of hierarchy and soul group family system going on between lives where you've got like a group of main main souls that you incarnate um, with frequently, not necessarily every time. And then you have guides that you, they're just your guides basically forever. And they're always on a level, a few levels above you. And all this is in a color coded system too. Like the souls being between lives, they're just sort of like luminous spheres that can holographically represent themselves as any of the lives that they've ever taken. And their color is, um, dependent on their level of advancement. And this is all super interesting to me and 
it actually kind of makes sense that we're all both students and teachers. Uh, and, you know, as you reach higher levels of soul growth, you become a teacher to a larger and larger number at once. And you, but you also have to interact with them less as that's going on. Um, because you're such a good teacher, you might only need to pop in one time in their life and like slap them in the face and say, Hey, stop fucking around. And then they're <laughs> good. You know, like, and those people do just show up in your life like that. And one mo one meeting can sometimes completely just set you in a different direction and you might never even see them again. So, you know, like, why does that happen? And maybe there is this, uh, this connection. The, the thing about it that trips me out and uh, I don't really like is the idea that there is a hierarchy to it, attached to it. And that seems to keep coming through, that there is sort of a hierarchy of development. And, you know, if you're not developing the way that, you're supposed to, then you have to redo things. And um, anyway, like, and what does all, all, all that lead to? Is is this just a simulated experience where we're learning before we even get to live in the place where all the, the masters live? Like this could be, according to this idea, this could be a shadow of the uh, true higher reality that we don't really get to access because we are almost like in remedial grade school or something because we're not behaving correctly. and. I don't really like that. That's where I, that's where I stop liking this idea and where it makes me wonder because um, the more that you increase love in, in this physical dimension, the more freedom there is and the less hierarchy exists, period. So if we're from a spiritual dimension where, which I think that there is a spiritual plane that we're emanating from in some capacity, and it is completely made of love, which I do feel that, then I don't, I don't know where I would stand on a, a hierarchy system existing there other than I don't see how it makes sense because love and freedom go hand in hand. Whereas control and hierarchies are always connected with like fear, fear that something wrong is going to happen. So anyway, um, while it does resonate with me that we might have people that we connect to over and over between lifetimes, um, I'm starting to finally come away from this conceptualization that I had for a while about like the spiritual hierarchy with guides and stuff although that it might exist in the spirit world because we have such hierarchy existences here in the physical world that might just reflect upward. And that's why we're creating those type of um, between life experiences. That was very long winded, but <laughs> that's what I think about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something that pulled my attention during your, um, during that explanation was how about like how I think there is a hierarchy and we think we're, we live in like the fourth dimension now. Or, or the fifth dimension, it's a fourth, right? Because we have time and we're third? like aware. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. In time. Um, so yeah, we have like third dimensional bodies. We have height, width, and length. And then when you add time, that's like the fourth dimension. And then dreaming into the, the fifth dimension, I think is when you essentially can like project more of like what's going to happen and like be more in tune with the past and the present and the future. Um, but I think that when we're able to kind of break out of this like kind of human experience that like the majority of our species is going through right now, um, there will be a lack or like a lessening of our density. So we kind of like, I don't know if that means that, you know, our soul leaves the body and we get to just be like, like, I don't know. I think of like Voldemort when he's between bodies, <laughs> <laughs> just like a wisp, like wandering around, like looking for, you know, something not of this dimension. Um, but yeah, it's kind of trippy. Sometimes I, I chalk it all up to sci-fi because it's not helpful to me in this moment. Um, and other times it just feel, it feels like the only real explanation for why I feel so connected to a person that I've never met before. Yeah, what is, I guess what's most important is to, regardless of how your mind tries to explain it to you, to not let that take you out of the present moment. And also um, to go back to the, to mentioning the episode about the colon cleanses, one of the things we talked about in that episode and has stayed with me and resonated with me for a long time since, ironically for what the concept is, is that whenever you have a big idea or epiphany, you have to, uh, you have to flush them uh, down the toilet. Uh, I call them metaphysical <laughs> dumps. You got to take, <laughs> you have to just like, you got to take all that stuff whenever you're way too full internally with all this information and it's getting too confusing and you, and what you think, you know, is conflicting too much with other things you think, you know, you just have to dump all of that stuff out and act like you and decide you don't know anything. And then as you go back to ground zero like that and experiences start coming in again, um, the old scaffolding of information that you do have 
will return as it is proven true in your experience without you having to be mentally trying to force a, an understanding of your experience into some epiphany or explanation for reality that you recently came up with. Because, you know, as, as soon as you start having those con like conflicting um, ideas about what it is, what was going on coming at you at once and you're in a very heightened like Kundalini awakening experience, something like that, it will freak you out or it'll send you into an ego, ego place and freak you out. Like for me, I would have big Kundalini energetic activations that just kind of come out of nowhere. And, um, I would start feeling higher and higher vibratory energy inside me, you know, not even on a catalyst or psychedelics, just like looking someone in the eyes and seeing the, it, the, the us, the one person that actually exists for a second. And it'd just be like, boom, shoot me up into my crown chakra. And I would start getting super scared. Like, this is it. I'm going to wake up from the dream of reality and I'm going to be somewhere else and it's all going to be gone. And everyone I care about, I'll never see them again because this is all just a dream. And I was just like so scared when that would happen all because I had this one wrong idea that this was all just a dream that I had gotten from somewhere else. And I just kept carrying it on. And you know, there is a lot to this that is like a dream, but it is also like a physical ground to conquer reality that we are in. And we don't need to be scared that, some sort of higher energetic experience or raising our frequency or whatever you want to call it um, going into your higher chakras is going to take you away from here because whatever it is that's true about your life and about your experience and about your memories and about yourself will remain true no matter what happens ever period because truth is truth is truth period. <laughs> that's a cool chance. Where did you, where does that concept come from? I'm curious. Cause that's like a big, like the mental baggage of trying to like, identify too much with what you've learned and being able to say like I don't you know being able to let go of it essentially and like kind of clean out the closet of all the books and just say like if this you know if this knowledge is meant to serve me I will remember it and it'll come back to me later but I don't have to like identify with it or make it about me that like, comes from hard experience no one told me that one <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. From getting scared too many times because I thought I knew what was going on and couldn't control it. You know, like that's basically what it was. And unfortunately, a lot of times that meant that what might have been a very beautiful, energetic, spiraling out experience into a, you know, like um, maybe even a vision state or some out of body experience, totally possible. But I shut it down because I was like thinking that it meant death or the end. In reality, it was my ego that was fighting to stay alive, not... Mm -hmm. You know, my, my idea of what the reality was that I was trying to hold on to that was fighting to stay alive. So that same concept of a, a false ego that is trying to control the experience of your reality is always coming up. And anytime there is a behavior or an attitude or something that tries to come in and take over and make you feel it, at the, like whether or not you are consciously choosing to do it and it's just trying to make it happen, that is a false ego self. And if you can really pay attention when you notice that come up, you can actually just go, nah. <laughs> like for me, what I've been doing, <laughs> what I've been doing is whatever it comes up, like um, this, like I'm gonna get mad at somebody at work about something, or I'm going to, you know, like fill in the blank, really. And I'm going yeah. to think that I've got to smoke cannabis to be to feel good right now. I can't just not smoke, you know. Anything like a compulsory thing. Um, my move has just been to go like this. I kill that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he stops bothering me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And that reminds me of what I wanted to ask you about before. Um, Cause the ego, I feel like is this character, this function. Cause it's like almost an organ in your body. Like yeah. all the organs in your body have purposes and your ego, it has a purpose and it can oh, yeah. be converted for good. Um, like using all those, what is it? The left brain or the right brain? <laughs> well, the true <laughs> ego would be coming through both at the same time, you know, being, being imbalanced one side or the other or imbalanced in both sides is what causes all these manifestations of chaos and trouble, honestly. Yeah. But that reminds me too of the, you were, you were saying the, what did you say? The suppressor or the, the opposer. Do you think that's the, the subconscious or the, maybe the lower than conscious brain that kind of just wants to keep you safe and keep you in the right all the time, just to keep you protected? Or what's your take on it? It is an intrinsic force to the reality without which things wouldn't exist. Um, 
I guess well, the, to explain it, you have to go back to the beginning of everything. And the beginning of everything is that there's really nothing. And what nothing is, is also the, the culmination of everything. Because if, if the universe was completely painted white, then there would be void. And if it was completely painted black, then there would be void. And so um, things also in a equilibrium with each other, balance each other out, cancel each other out. There are no waves of experience to be had. So everything is also simultaneously nothing. Well, if that's the case, why doesn't it cancel itself out and there's you know, a null experience? That's actually because there's one exception to this rule of every, the all that uh, the rule of things canceling themselves out within the all. And that exception is power or effectiveness itself. So the opposite of everything that cancels itself out doesn't exist for that concept because its opposite is ineffectiveness or non-power. So basically out of nothing slash everything emerges this one principle of power or effectiveness. And it actually immediately starts splitting into um, distinguishing uh, dualities as well. You have, because there's more than one type of effectiveness. And the two types of effectiveness are the effect of fullness and the effect of the void or the effect of emptiness, the effect of light and the effect of darkness or the effect of love and the effect of fear and all of those things can be contained within the concepts that we call god or the creator and then the opposing uh, idea or satan or the the internal opposition that which reduces consciousness versus that which expands consciousness so literally everything the reason everything is expressing along these dualistic principles is because it's all uh, ever competing complexity game of chess almost between these two forces that are all act, that are completely being controlled by the same character which is effect itself or power itself and at the root level of consciousness and being the the first emanation that we all actually are is that thing the gnostic um gnostic traditions call it abraxas it is kind of a freaky concept because it's basically the all containing good and evil put together. It's not God. It's beyond, it's the God above God. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if that answers uh, the point. That's cool. Yeah. That's new information for me. Abraxas that like kind of made my antenna go up when you said that. It's a powerful entity. It, um, it does exist as a life form the same way that we do. And it's within us in a weird sense. And I think the evolution of consciousness back towards source eventually leads us to that point of Abraxas where um, you are the destroyer of worlds and the creator of worlds simultaneously, the, the uh, Shiva Vishnu dichotomy. And, um, you know, not to say that that's what we are going to be in this life or that's what we are in this life. Far from it. As human beings, we are many, many levels of, distinguishment and separation along dualistic poles removed from that concept of abraxas. What, I mean, what it is is hard to even explain what, because it, it's so all encompassing that it's basically nothing other than a force. It's the force, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we are, we, we're a little, much more complicated and we actually have the ability. We're curious because we have the ability to choose where we want to land on all of these dualistic pole planes of characteristics and we actually are able to distinguish ourselves from the all however we want and continue to distinguish and distinguish and distinguish through will and choice and uh that's very interesting for sure yeah through will and through choice and uh that another trippy concept i've been thinking about lately is um sort of like letting go letting go of ambition to figure out you know what i really stand for without the external just inner 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 seeking just inside my own idea of what's right versus what like seeking validation from the external um and my i think it's like the ego is trying to narrate and say like well beth what's going to happen to your life if you don't have any ambition if you don't like try to achieve anything and i know that i still will always have like ambition and maybe not in the sense same sense of like that word that i know it now um, but like not needing to be validated by others 
or by society or by some made up dream that we're told when we're little. Um, and like almost tuning it out for a really good long while before finding out like what my, my dream is, what my story is. Yeah. To even understand the external world, there's an entire series of, there's an entire series of mental veils that must be lifted. Like we were saying at the beginning, we have a big filtration system between direct experience reality of the present moment and what's actually happening in our minds and things that uh, as seemingly basic as your linguistic operating system can control things as monumental as the colors that you see. Right. And so um, to lift those veils, the ancients had the concept that what the reality behind reality actually is, is a goddess of wisdom and truth. And they conceptualize her as such because to lift those veils uh, and get closer to the present moment and understanding what is really reality and what is really going on requires um, both checking internally for your, with your conscience and your feelings, um, but also checking that against your actions in the world and learning what actions are basically right and wrong uh, in line with natural law. That's why a lot of Masonic and many other representations of the goddess, she's holding a book, which is called the Torah, which is also connected to an ancient Egyptian name for the goddess, which is, uh, uh, Ter I think Terra or something. And, mm or uh, something along those lines. There's etymological connection there. And in, in the Kabbalistic and he Jewish and Hebrew traditions, that means the book of law. So the more that you can actually learn what is right and wrong and the laws of the reality that you find yourself in and move within those things, paradoxically, the more free you get and the more you're lifting the veils to the ultimate higher reality. But one thing they all, the ancients also conceptualize with the idea of lifting the veil of the goddess is that there are various trials and aspects of life and experience that must be undergone in order to lift the veil. Uh, it's like a test of your courage. First of all, you have to be willing to have everybody that you know basically say that you're wrong or not listen to you or even talk bad about you, and you still have to know that you're doing the right thing, period. And then you have to also be able to quell the ambition. Uh, the unbridled ambition to matter in the world, to leave a legacy or a mark. And that's why there are very few spiritually enlightened people that actually wind up leaving a trace or a footprint historically, because that's part of the trial is to uh, let go of that because you can't really gain higher levels of awareness and therefore power or ability if your intention has anything to do with personal gain, personal glory, personal profit. It just doesn't happen. And that's something I've done plenty of research on too. And like there, are, there are doctors that are, you know, country bumpkins that have the ability to like, they have no education, they make no money, but they might, they have the ability to look at somebody and know exactly what's wrong with them through some kind of spiritual aid or guidance that we aren't privy to, and then walk up and do what seems like a miraculous procedure surgically, or ba maybe just barely touch them and then they're healed. Uh, you know, that there are a lot of stories like that. There's video evidence of that kind of thing. But again, <clears throat> those kind of people end up having bad shit happen to them sometimes. And it's not, it's like you have to be ready for that idea that this thing is going to be challenging. It, like what we are being put through now in terms of learning these beliefs, uh, or not beliefs, learning these natural laws. It, if we don't actually take heed and put them into practice, the chaotic aspects of the, the crucifixion, as it's called, where we're put between all these forces, like elementally, which are represented by the ambition and by the external world and by uh, other types of trials. If we, if we practice these natural law principles, we're learning and apply them in conscience and um, selflessly, I think that we can transition smoothly through this Kali Yuga period into the next period and not necessarily have to suffer at the hands of chaos that badly or randomness but there are going to be some components of that no matter what especially for people that we care about that aren't putting natural law into practice and um you know we're gonna it's gonna really challenge that ability or that feeling that we have um of realizing we're not really in control but the you know the desire to fall into the trap of trying to be in control we will be challenged on this <laughs> yeah for sure wow that was awesome I just learned so much. I feel like I should be taking notes. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, natural law and the Kabbalistic tradition, I will definitely be checking those those concepts out more. Yeah, um, a good resource for that, and it's a little hard for people to stomach, but I will still direct you to it. There's a <laughs> podcaster named Mark Passio who's got a show called What on Earth is Happening? Uh-huh. And um, the podcast is already complete. It's run its course. It's like 198 episodes. And Whoa. if you start from the beginning, it is a very, very solid initiation into hermetic principles, which are just natural law principles that have been passed on for thousands of years. Um, Kabbalistic ideas. The thing that makes it hard for people to handle though, is the first 50 or so episodes of the show for the most part, he's actually talking about the methodologies of mind control and the symbolism used by dark occultists to keep people in a state of fear and unconsciousness. And that makes people who are in any form of denial just turn it off right away and they just can't handle it because they're like, this is too negative. I don't like that he's yelling about how cops are order followers and you should tell them that they should stop being cops. <laughs> but, <laughs> Because you should just never be an order follower for money. Just never, by the way. You should never just do whatever someone says only for money and not think about it yourself. That's like the ultimate violation of natural law, that and stealing. So uh, he he goes into these principles really solidly. You can't learn everything you need to learn from him by any means, but he will point you in the direction of many resources and get – it's kind of the type of deal where like when – well, this is what they've always said in hermetic hermetic principles and uh, traditions is that – um, the, when the student's ears are open, the master, um, will begin to speak and, you know, that'll come in the form of many different teachers and, um, resources that will just open up to you out of nowhere. As soon as your mindset shifts from, I'm just trying to figure this all out and see what I think about things. And, you know, I I don't really know what the world is and, and, uh, it's kind of confusing, la di da di da to there is such a thing as truth and I'm going to find it out. Like <laughs> Switching to that mindset, it, um, not saying that you're the arbiter of truth or anything, not becoming the arbiter of truth, but actually figuring out the, you know, and that's why you go back to ancient sources for this because the truth has always existed. It's always been with us. It's always been with humanity, but for the most part, it's been kept in the hands of a small amount of people who either wanted to control others by knowing it or wanted to stay alive. And that's why they didn't tell people about it because the controllers would kill them for it. And now we have the chance to learn this stuff, but that's why the new age deluge of so many um, problematic concepts are being thrown into ancient principles that are actually helpful is to keep people from realizing there's such a thing as natural law and to keep people in the idea that truth and morality is relative and that we can decide these things for ourselves. And that's total ego. That's man trying to be God. That's how we, how we even got laws in the first place. And we all know how laws are working out right now for our, our society. Not well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Chance. Oh my gosh. I feel like I need to stop you because I need to like meditate and journal. <laughs> yeah. It's lot. about my time to be jumping off here. I have some company <laughs> that showed up a few minutes ago. I want to go say hi to. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. But I'm really grateful that we connected because I've, I feel like I've thought about Costa Rica and Envision every day since we were there. Like the ocean has come back into my dreams or like the music like pops back into my head. Like it's just such a cool, like I'm just so glad that we met and I'm so glad we got to talk tonight. (laughs) Yeah, we'll do it several more times. And thank you for letting me record this one because I feel like we hit some really high points as far as uh, reflection with one another. It was really great. Totally. Yeah. Looking forward to doing it next month. For sure. Uh, thanks so much, Chance. Thank you. I mean, thanks, Haley for me. Yeah, I will. Uh, maybe I can get her to come say hi after we stop the recording. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. This has been um, my conversation with Beth. I guess I introduced that in the intro anyway. I uh, love you guys. Bye.